Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. And we believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday at 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Covenant. It's great to gather with you and and worship with you. If you're a a guest, a special welcome to you. You know, we gather to worship the one who is faithful, who is steady, who is unwavering. We worship the one who never grows tired. He is never weak. He never is weary. As our call to worship says, he is faithful. He is faithful forever. And so I invite you to stand, if you would now, as we read our call to worship and remind ourselves of the one who never grows tired and is never weary and is steady with us. He is faithful. Please join aloud in the all section. Peace be with you. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. And so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we gather here to praise you, to remember Again, how you have revealed yourself to be, God, that you are faithful, that you are steady, that you never grow tired, that you are never weary, that you are never fatigued, that, God, you are good. In all of creation, we can see your goodness, and we can see your goodness in our lives, and ultimately and perfectly, we can see your goodness in the cross of Jesus Christ. So I pray in our heart and our minds and our bodies and our souls, you would calm us, you would quiet us, and remember again who you are, God, and that you are good and you're good to us. And we pray all this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. i 
may be seated. Lord, we do praise you this morning. Lord, with the words that we say, with the posture of our heart, with the thoughts of our minds and with our bodies and emotions and thoughts, Lord, we praise you this morning because you are worthy of all of our praise. Lord, our minds are stretched to contemplate you and your character in eternity and also in your creation. We think of the vastness of the galaxies and yet we also think of just the intricate details Lord, of uh, insects, and just your wonder how it reaches great heights and great depths. Lord, we pray that you would stretch our imagination this morning in understanding you, in understanding your character and in your people. Lord, that we would worship you this morning with grateful hearts, praising you and thanking you for all that you've done in creating in saving and sustaining us. We praise you for that truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, worship isn't maybe just something that we do. Worship is actually where God does something to us. And as we turn our attention now to our prayer of confession, we're reminded that this isn't so much about what we're doing, but about what God is doing in us and through us and to us in this actual time and space and place as we hear each other in prayer and in confession. God is doing something in us. He is reorienting us. He is reforming us. He is training us, in a sense, to be more Christ-like. He is taking our brokenness and our misplaced hopes and desires, and he is mending us and placing our hopes and desires in him so that we can be perfectly fulfilled and enjoy him. So I invite you to read over our prayer of confession. I'll give you a moment to do that, and then I'm gonna invite us to pray this together because the Christian life is one that is lived in community with brothers and sisters, and we are all equally coming this morning in desperate need of God's goodness, of his forgiveness, of his mending, and of enjoying him. So take a moment to read over this prayer of confession. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, who formed the human family to live in peace, we acknowledge before you our divisions, quarrels, injustices, and greed. May your church demonstrate before the world the power of the gospel to destroy division, so that in Christ Jesus there may be no barriers of wealth or class age or intellect, race or color, but all may be equally your children, members one of another and heirs together of your everlasting kingdom. Amen. Now take a moment before the Lord personally receive his invitation to come to him with our brokenness and our misplaced hopes and desires and take a moment to confess your sins privately to God knowing that he hears you, that he understands you and loves you. Receive these words of encouragement from 2 Corinthians. Paul wrote, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, not counting our sins against us, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Lord, you are compassionate and gracious. You are slow to anger. You are abounding in love. That is who you are, and that's, Lord, such comfort and good news for us. But even more so, Lord, we know that that is how you are to us, individually, personally, as well as as a community. Lord, you will always be compassionate and gracious, 
slow to anger, and abounding in love towards us. May we live in light of that truth. Lord, help us to enjoy your graciousness and to show your compassion, your gentleness, and your kindness to others. Lord, we praise you that you are our cornerstone, that you are building us up together in you, that you are reorienting us and training us more and more into your likeness. And Lord, give us eyes to see the fruit of that work. Lord, there are different seasons in our lives, and sometimes we feel so much of that fruit, and other times we don't see any of that fruit. But let us encourage one another and build one another up, Lord, in you, and as we reflect your character to one another for the sake of reconciliation. Lord, that our relationships with others would reflect, Lord, your reconciliation to, with us. We praise you, Lord, for your forgiveness and for who you are and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you now to please stand with me. We are going to declare the Apostles' Creed. This is the essentials of the Christian faith. As we've just uh, prayed and confessed that there are very real and devastating divisions among people. This is what unites us together, this truth. Uh, there's nothing necessarily magical in these words, but the truth that these words express are what unites us together with Christians who have uh, faithfully followed Christ around the world today, as well as throughout history. So I invite you to declare this truth with me together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Creator loves us so much. He won't let us stay the way we are. He's always working in our lives.
please be seated. Now is the, oh, first of all, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. It's always nice to hear your voices. It's a lot better than hearing mine. Um, <clears throat> now is the opportunity for the children to go in the back and meet your teacher for Sunday school. And it's also an opportunity for the rest of us to stand up, exercise your legs a little, and meet somebody that perhaps you don't know. Thank you. All right, I'll invite you to find your seats once again. My name is Kennerly. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, delighted to have you here this morning. I want to draw your attention to the back of your worship handout before I do that. I'm drawing your attention to the bookmark that you hopefully received this morning. Just want you to uh, be aware that this is available to you. So this will follow along with our sermon series. This is a great way to be uh, in conversation just with other people here about reading God's word. And um, for every passage, you can ask yourself the question of what does this teach me about God or show me about God? And what does this show me about uh, myself? So... Uh, I invite you to take advantage of that opportunity of just um, the discipline of being in God's word every single day and hearing from him and seeing what he does with you uh, through that practice. On the back of your worship handout are a few important announcements that I want to draw your attention to. So if you are not already receiving our weekly email, there is a QR code to sign up to receive those. That's a wonderful way to have more details about what is going on in our community. There's also three different ways to give towards the work that is happening here at Covenant, so I want to make sure that you are aware of that. And then today is the day that you've all been waiting for. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we have our uh, once a year congregational meeting, and so that will be, yay, <laughs> that will be, um, we'll have just a very brief break after our worship service, and uh you can get water or coffee to your heart's content. And then uh, come right back into this space, and we will be um, starting our congregational meeting. So just a brief break in between. Child care is being provided through uh, the break and the meeting for those um, who need that. So I encourage you to stay. This is um, really a wonderful way as um, a family and as a household of faith for us to gather to hear and praise uh, God for what he has done in the past year to look forward to what is in store for us in the year to come also to vote in our new elders and deacons and just to appreciate their uh, time and um, effort in giving of their gifts and their wisdom to the work here at Covenant uh, we need one another so the meetings a really important and essential part of the life of our church Tomorrow is a big day. I hope you really just take a moment to enjoy the seat that you are sitting in right now, because that seat is going to be gone tomorrow, or in process. Um, so tomorrow we start uh, the clearing the ground for new pews to be in. So it'll be um, a good practice for all of us in practicing our adaptability and flexibility, which, you know, is such a wonderful human nature, you know, natural gift that we all have. So we will have a chair set up next Sunday. It will look different, so just take in the blue seats and enjoy them. Uh, so we'll be uh, starting that work, and then July, let's see, it's in the July 9th. We're expecting to have our new pews and new flooring in, so we're really looking forward to that. I invite you to pray for the work that will be going on, for the workers who will be here throughout the week working, and just for God's wisdom, and, you know, there's always decisions that come up with any construction. So just that that would be um, good work that is done and that it would be really fruitful and helpful for our community, for those who will also be joining our community, just in how we sit and how we gather. Um, so pray for that. Also, on July 22nd, we are participating in the Day of Service with Hope for San Diego. And this is a really fun day. It's a day, we've done this for several years now. And uh, Hope for San Diego gathers together different opportunities with different partnerships around our city. And I think what one thing I really appreciate about the Day of Service is there's something fun about knowing that this work is all being done on the same day, 
all around our city and in different aspects of um, work. However, all of these partnerships, it's not just one day. All of these partnerships are throughout the year. There are opportunities to form relationships and continue to work with them and their work and helping just people who are in various circumstances, I guess, of need and vulnerability. So I appreciate the, the energy and the excitement around one day of gathering and that intentionality, but know that this work is not just one day. This work is a daily practice of looking to the needs and the concerns of loving our neighbors. So there are a ton of opportunities just in the coming, just save the date for July 22nd, but over the next few weeks, we'll be highlighting just um, maybe a few like intentional ways that we can particularly serve just in our community. So look for more information about that. I'm going to pray for our church, and then I'll invite Dean up in just a minute. Jesus, thank you for how you are building us together into your people, that you are our cornerstone, that you are our foundation. Lord, that we are a unique community that doesn't make sense on any account apart from you and apart from your work in your life and in your death and in your resurrection. Lord, that that marks us out as people, that that is what unites us together. That is why we are here this morning. That is why we care for our neighbors. And that is why we want to hear from your word. I pray that you would give us receptive hearts and eager ears to hear your truth this morning, that we would... Uh, be reoriented, that we would be reformed, Lord, in what we hear, and that it wouldn't just be uh, new information that we learn, but that it would be a training and a discipling for our lives that changes how we see one another, how we see you, the way that we do our lives. Lord, we thank you that your word is living and active, and that your spirit is here in our midst this morning to make it come alive to us. And to transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. And Dean will come up this morning. He will be doing our scripture reading. Our scripture this morning is Acts 2, 37 to 47. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. It is the name of the Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dean. And Kennerly for leading us in worship. And, you know, we're coming to the end of uh, this short three-part series that we've been looking at in Acts 2 called Devoted. You know, to be devoted, the word devotion is a serious word. There's nothing flippant about devotion. Devotion is intentional. When you're devoted to something, you're kind of leaning into it. You give your full attention to it. And to be devoted to something, and we're all, being, we're all devoted to something, but... It depends on what we're devoted to. We can be devoted to things that give us life or drain us of life. We can be devoted to things that we were made for or things that we make up. We can be devoted to things that lead to our withering or lead to our flourishing. We're all devoted to something. We're all tempted to be devoted to things. Michael Norton, he's a professor at Harvard Business School. He did a study on 2,000 millionaires 
And he asked them two simple questions. He said, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you? 10 being the happiest. And then he said, what would get you to a 10? And he said, every single millionaire said two to three times more money would get them closer to 10. There was a sense of so being devoted to money that they needed more and more to find happiness. So we can be devoted to things that we are made for or things that we make up. Or how about Kevin Durant? Kevin Durant, the famous basketball player, 10 NBA seasons, eight all-star selections, four scoring championships, an MVP. He won the championship in 2017 with the Golden State Warriors. But after that victory that summer, he fell into a bit of depression and was despondent. Steve Nash, an advisor for the Warriors and someone who was helping Durant through this time, said this. He said, Durant was searching for what it all meant. He thought a championship would change everything, and he found out it didn't. He was not fulfilled. So we can be devoted to things, give ourselves away to things that lead to our withering or our flourishing. How about one more voice? Jim Carrey, the Hollywood star, Jim Carrey, said this, I wish that everybody, everybody could get rich and famous. So Jim Carrey wants you all to be rich and famous and have everything you ever dreamed of so that you'll know it's not the answer. Someone on the pinnacle of fame and fortune and, fame and success said, if that's what you're devoted to, it won't live up to your expectations. Are we devoted to that which we were made for or what we make up? See, to be devoted to the things of God and to be connected to God, to be devoted to him actually leads to a place of rest. But to be devoted to things apart from God, separate from God, to make money or success or stardom or whatever you insert to make that your ultimate leads to restlessness. It's actually long ago what church father Augustine said. Augustine said, you, God, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That actually to give ourselves to God, to be intentionally devoted to God, is this place of rest. It's this place of peace. And when we reside in that place of peace, it actually brings us into community. That to be devoted to God means to be devoted to his people. You know, throughout the church, God's people have been called the temple or the adopted family or the body or the flock. In other words, the church. To be devoted, what we are made to be devoted to, which is Jesus, that place of rest, that place of peace, is actually then to make us be devoted to each other. And that's what this passage is, is about. You see it in verse 42. You see the word. They devoted themselves. That these early Christians, that this first church in the book of Acts, they devoted themselves, they gave themselves, nothing flippant. They were really leaning in to being devoted to God and then devoted to each other. And it was this place of peace for them. This place, not of restlessness, but of rest. And it wasn't a one-time activity. It was more of a lifestyle, a continual way of living, of being devoted to God and devoted to each other. And when we make ourselves devoted to God, what type of community does that create? And this is really the, the movement of our sermon today. They were living in community. They were learning in community. They were loving in community. And finally, they were leaning out in community. That to be devoted to God makes a, a certain community like this. And it's like the four-legged table. If you take one of the legs out, the table will fall down. But the table needs all four legs to stand, to, to be together, to learn, to love, and to lean out. It all goes together. So let's walk through what this, this description of both the first church and, in fact, what every church should be. A church devoted to God looks like, like this. So first, they were living in community. And it's worth stating the obvious, but do you notice all the plural words in this passage? They, together. And just look at verse 47. 47 is one example. It says, every day they continued. So you go, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. 
you just, you see this intentionality of togetherness, that they were living in community together. You see it in formal ways. It talks about meeting in the temple courts, which in our day would be a kind of translating to what we're doing here. This regular gathering of God's people together in, in more formal, structured ways. Essential. But also there's informal gatherings. They're meeting around tables. They're meeting in homes, what, what we might call just table fellowship, but also you know, community groups and men's and women's Bible studies. Formal, structured ways, being together, informal ways, sharing a meal, studying the Bible together, praying together. They were living in community together. Megan Hill, in her book, Identity Theft, she puts it powerfully this way. The church is established by Christ, protected and nourished by Christ, governed by Christ, and exists for the glory of Christ. Because of this, the church is also not optional. A group that you could join or not join, depending on your personality and preferences. The church is is fundamental to the identity of everyone who belongs to Christ. Think about it this way. Think of a, a, you know, a grill with some coals burning inside, hot, warm coals. When those coals are, are next to each other and they're glowing and they're light up, there's, there's a fire, there's a warmth when we're together. But if you were to take one of those coals that was a glow in the fire and take it out away from the other coals, eventually that, that glow would wane and that fire wouldn't burn. The same as us, we were meant to be together, <laughs> to be connected, and so together, we burn with the fire of Christ. But if you to take a follower of Christ away from the community and outside, that glow wanes, and that fire doesn't burn as strongly. The first church, this church, meant to live together, but also second, to learn in community, learning in community. So they're together, but they're also, they're, they're engaging and they're thinking and they're entering into formation. Verse 42, the church devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And you see here three distinct ways that they were learning. The apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Now, who were the apostles? The apostles were simply the ones who were with Jesus. They heard Jesus teach. They were there on the Sermon on the Mount. They saw the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. They were there, entrusted with this message, entrusted with this salvation story. And they were the sent ones, sent out in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth to proclaim the teachings of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection. And those same teachings were passed down generation after generation to what we have in the Bible today. See, the Bible is the apostles' teachings. And they learn from that and we learn from that. There's also the breaking of bread which is a phrase that just technically means the sacrament of communion of the Lord's Supper. It's where we take and we eat the bread and we take the cup and we drink and we remember Christ's body broken for us and Christ's blood shed for us that the habit of rising from our seats, seeing each other, taking, engaging the whole body and all the senses, holding, tasting, smelling, eating, swallowing, that there is a learning that takes place in that breaking of bread. The apostles teaching the breaking of bread, prayer, structured prayer sometimes, like we do every week with the prayer of confession to shape our thinking and our prayer lives. Spontaneous prayers of what's going on in our hearts and our minds that we bring to God, both to remind us that there is more than meets the eye. So there's that first church and this church together, Formal, informal ways, learning together from the apostles' teaching, the scriptures, the sacraments, the breaking of bread, prayer. And in a way you could say, and it's been talked about, that the church is compared to a weight room or a gymnasium. So you go to that place to engage your mind, to think, to mentally sweat, and to work out what has been passed down to us. What do we believe and how do we take what we believe and then go out to the culture 
so that when we go out to the culture, we can embrace what is good about that is around us in our neighborhood and city and not always be defensive, but also we can take what's been passed down to us and we can go out to the world and we can critique what is wrong and not always just go with the flow. So we wrestle, we go into that weight room of the apostles' teaching and the sacraments and prayer and we engage. That Christianity is a religion of the heart, yes, but also the mind. We don't shut our minds off. So living in community, learning in community, loving in community. Verses 44 and 45 give this radical picture of generosity, of knowing the needs of each other and meeting those needs, which both go together. Do, do we know each other's needs? And then are we compelled by the love of Christ to meet those needs? Just hear verse 45 again. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. See, the church is often called the household of faith or brothers and sisters in Christ. And a family at its best version is a family that cares for the needs of those family members. Willie Jenkins, he's a professor at Yale University. He has this uh, provocative line. He says, time, talent, and treasures. Time, talent, and treasures, the trinity of possessions, feel the pull of this holy vortex. See, what he's saying is there's a holy vortex of the love of Christ just pulls on our time and our talent and our possessions, not with clenched fists, but we open hands because we want to be people of generosity because we have been met with generosity. And this isn't a call to, to communism or some sort of version of socialism. If you were to read the book of Acts, there's still possessions, there's still homes. It's just radical generosity that these first Christians were so overwhelmed and influenced by the generosity of Jesus towards them and their cup was so full and overflowing because of that generosity of Christ that they couldn't help but meet the needs of those around us. They were loving in community and then finally leaning out in community. There's radical church growth in verse 41. It says 3,000, 3,000 were added to their number. Now think about this for a moment. So there was 120 people that made up that first church in Acts that the Holy Spirit came upon. 120. And then Peter preaches this message and 3,000 joined them. Which means that 120 were making room in their life, making space in their life, that, that these 3,000 people could find a way into their community that I heard one person say, the church is a family expecting guests. I like that. The church is a family expecting guests. That we are a family, and yet we know that God is not done. That he's not done. That he's still at work. He's calling adults and children, those far away from him. And those first 120, they modeled this picture of having room in their life, having space in their church, that God was going to do it. Not them. They didn't save 3,000. God was at work to bring these 3,000 into the community. And they were ready and willing and excited. Leslie Newbegin, he was a missionary for 40 years in India. And after that time in India, he went back to his home country of England and reflected on his time in India and just the, the movement of evangelism in the early church and he talks about this explosion of joy that happened. This is what Newbegin says. He says, mission begins with a kind of explosion of joy. I love that. That we are propelled not by pulling ourselves out by our bootstraps or guilt or anything like that. It's an explosion of joy. The news that the rejected and crucified Jesus is alive is something that can't possibly be suppressed. It must be told who could be silent about such a fact? The mission of the church in the pages of the New Testament, which we are reading here and looking at, is more like, I love this, I love this image, is more like the fallout from a vast explosion, a radioactive fallout, which is not lethal, but life-giving. It's not lethal, but life-giving. 
that this church was so compelled and overwhelmed by the explosion of joy in their lives because Christ was alive, Christ is dead, Christ is risen from the grave. This hope was so powerful that it was just an explosion and they couldn't help but lean out and welcome. So we, Covenant Church, are planted in the soil of that first church. Lord, help us to be a community that lives together and learns together, loves each other well, and leans out. Five quick thoughts. Five quick thoughts. Why be devoted to church? For Jesus. For Jesus' sake. See, the church at its best and at its worst is still Jesus' church. And he promised that he will never leave or forsake his church. The church is Jesus' bride. So we, if we're devoted to Jesus, we're devoted to his bride Why be devoted to church? For your own good. See, left to ourselves to be this coal that we want to burn by ourselves over here, that glow is going to wane. And we're going to end up, if we're by ourselves, making God in our own image instead of together being formed in the image of Christ. It's for the good of Jesus. It's for the good of yourself. It's for the person next to you. So your presence is powerful. That when you show up, you say, you say, this is worth it. And you say to the person next to you, without even using words, they are worth it. Your presence matters. For the good of North Park in San Diego, that we live in a a neighborhood in a city at large that is so transient and on the move and ever-changing, that there's something powerful about this church on the corner of Howard and 30th being an outpost of hope year after year, decade after after decade. And finally, to practice for heaven. To practice for heaven. The book of Revelation talks about heaven being this gathering of, of all peoples and nations and tribes together around the throne of Christ in a world in the way that it's supposed to be where all death and mourning and crying and pain are passed away and everything will be made new. That when we gather, we are, we are wetting our appetite that we're practicing for heaven. So practically, what might this look like for you, this idea, this example of this first church? One thought would be, join the Sunday meal. Regularly join the Sunday meal. That move from being an occasional guest to a regular person sitting at the table. Move from just showing up for the Thanksgiving family meal (laughs) but regularly gathering for that Sunday meal, showing up. The late pastor, Tim Keller, he, he said once, someone asked him, can a person be a Christian without being a part of a church? Can a person be a Christian without being a part of a church? And Tim Keller said, well, yes, of, of course. But they're not going to be a healthy Christian. They're going to stumble and falter and fall on this journey of life. They're a coal that's meant to burn with the other coals and to be a glow together. So maybe for you, as you think about this passage and this message, for you, it's moving from just being an occasional guest to really making this a part of your life and regularly showing up for the family meal. Maybe for others, a second way, just be known Be known and know others. Verse 46 again, they met together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together. See, these Christians, this example of the first church, whether it was Sunday gatherings or meals at homes or in smaller groups or Bible studies, they knew each other. They really knew each other. And they were known. And maybe for us, that's the movement that we need to to make with this passage. It's not just showing up and leaving and kind of checking that box. It's not showing up at the Sunday meal, but we we never talk. But it's being known and no others. Maybe it's taking a risk and being a part of a community group or a men's or women's Bible study. Maybe it's raising your hand and saying, I'm going to serve regularly somewhere on a Sunday. Yes, to serve, but also to be known and to know others. Maybe it's the Hope for San Diego service opportunity where you're going to raise your hand and say, I'm going to to try that out to be known. Yes, to serve, but to be known and to know others. 
So maybe it's joining up for the Sunday meal. Maybe it's, it's being known. Or maybe for some of us, it's leaving room in our lives. See, God did a miracle here. 3,000 people came to faith. And those 120 people, they needed to have room in their life to receive what God was doing. And maybe for some of us, we've, we've forgotten. We've forgotten what it's like to be, to be new to church. And we haven't left margin and room in our life for what God is doing. Because in verse 39, it says, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Do we really believe that? Do we believe that God is not done? He is still calling children and adults and those far away from him to himself. And if God is going to do that work, are we going to receive the invitation to participate in it and leave room in our lives to receive them as they come? Maybe come a little early before the service. Linger afterwards. Leave, leave room for a conversation. Leave room for a lunch meeting in your week. And you don't know who you're going to invite to that lunch, but you're just going to leave space to try to know somebody else and them to know you. Is there, just, is there room at your dining room table? Is there room in your life? A church that was devoted to being together and to learning and to loving and to leaning out. Lord, help us be that church as well. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. But really at the core, why did they devote themselves? What was so compelling? It's because they saw Jesus devoted to them. Jesus, the one who claims to be the creator of the heavens and earth, the one who was in the glory of heaven and had all honor and praise and thousands upon thousands of angels singing his wonder and bowing before him. That Jesus was so devoted to his church and to you and to me that he laid it aside. He left the glory and wonder of heaven and he became one of no reputation. He was so devoted to you that he went to the cross and he willingly let the Father forsake him, the rupture of that relationship. He was so devoted to you, he was forsaken so that you could know the love of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to be in that loving relationship that you were meant to be. See, they did this. Acts 2 exists. They were devoted because of Jesus' devotion to them. And it's the same needs to be for us. We don't, we don't fix our eyes on our will for community or a desire to learn or, or some sort of willpower to love you know, those around us or our neighbors, we fix our eyes on Jesus. And we see how devoted he is to us. And we let that well up in our hearts. And when that is welled up, then and only then can we go out and have the desire to, to be generous and to make space and to really engage with our minds and to be a community. And as we come to this table every Sunday, I talked about this is a table that has been practiced since the beginning of the church, the breaking of bread, where we see tangibly, physically, Christ's devotion to us. This is a table of devotion. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant in his blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And whenever we eat from the bread and we drink from the cup, we proclaim that Jesus is devoted. That Jesus is devoted to his church. That Jesus is devoted to you until he returns. So Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you for this cup. Lord, we thank you for your bride, the church. Forgive her for all her, her failings. And Lord, we know that you love your church. And you call us to be a people devoted to you, and in being devoted to you, you call us to be devoted to each other. I pray as we rise from our seats and we take and we eat and we taste, we might remember and reflect in new ways how devoted you are to Jesus.
how you are devoted to us. And together, aloud in one voice, we pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Praying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, rise from your seats. Come to the table. Eat and drink now by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's stand together and declare how devoted we are. Um, he is worthy of every song, of every action we do in his name.
Amen. Amen. Receive uh, the Lord's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.